So this morning we have with us uh, three uh, panelists that are very experienced in ILS. So starting from uh, uh, Chantal Bernsden from Allborn Partners. Uh, is an asset consultant that's been very active in uh, researching both ILS and ILS managers. Uh, maybe uh, Chantal, if you don't mind, to introduce yourself. Sure. Um as Lorenzo said, I'm a senior hedge fund IDD analyst at Allborn Partners. We um, advise invest institutional investors on um, investments in the alternative space. Um, we also provide middle and back office services. We do investment due diligence, operational due diligence. I specifically focus on investment due diligence on ILS funds, which has uh, given me the opportunity to speak with many of you in the room. So uh, I'm looking forward to catching up. Thanks, Chantal. Then to her left, uh, we have Raffaele Dell'Amore. Raffaele works for uh, Seagull Advisors, which is another asset consultant based in Zurich. Raffaele, if you don't mind to introduce yourself, thank you. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Yes, I'm a partner at Siglo. We advise mainly Swiss institutional clients uh, related to their alternative investments. ILS is one of that pillar where Swiss clients are kind to. Um, we have other business lines. I've been in the industry for a couple of years, uh, managing ILS funds myself, and got through the study of physics and the modeling of risk or reinsurance risk into this industry. So a little bit uh, a circle around many aspects of, 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 this, <coughs> of this business. Thanks, Rafael. And immediately to my left, uh, I have Martin Diaz. Martin. It uh, works for Legal and General Asset Management. Martin, please. Yeah, so I'm, a, I'm an asset allocator at Legal and General Investment Management. So I manage multi-asset funds. I uh, manage one of our fund ranges, which is very much for institutional clients, lots of pension schemes, DC and DB. Um, and in terms of history, a very long time ago, I was a consultant, and actually I covered all of the, the cap fund managers maybe 12, 14 years ago. Excellent. At Willis Towers Watson, right? Yeah. So before I, I ask uh, more questions to our panelists, I just want to make uh, you know, three initial comments about the market. So first of all, uh, as we heard from our keynote speaker, the property cut pricing has been at the highest uh, for at least a decade. And I'm not sure whether you've read the recent survey from Moody's, but it was interesting to read that Moody's has uh, approached 42 global uh, PNC insurance companies to basically assess what there is ex their expectation for pricing at the 1st of January renewal. And the consensus has been that we do expect further premium increases at about mid single digit. And this is driven primarily from uh, the inflationary pressure on the claims and uh, need for more capital. Now, my question obviously is uh, whether we need more capital, whether the capital insurance capital is simply being way more selective. I think that's really the key point, as we heard from the uh, keynote speaker earlier. Primary insurance companies are now absorbing more of uh, the future potential losses. And if premiums continue to grow, we, it will be the seventh consecutive year since 2017 for premiums to grow. So that's the first comment. The second one is that the first uh, half of the year has seen uh, an amount of industry losses uh, of around $50 billion. That's an estimate from Swiss Re. And this has been above uh, historical average. And this has been caused largely by secondary perils, including and uh, mostly the convective storms uh, or the thunderstorms in the US, more than $30 billion. On top of that, we've seen uh, uh, floods and cyclones in New Zealand. We've seen an earthquake in Turkey. And more recently, we've been monitoring Hurricane Idalia that made landfall in Florida at Category 3 on August 30 with estimated losses between 3 to $5 billion from uh, RMS. Now, we hope that this is going to be an earning event. That What I say we hope is for the insurance industry rather than a capital event for insurers, and losses are expected to be mostly retained by primary insurance companies. The last comment 
is that despite uh, our marketing efforts, and when I say our, I mean ILS managers, but also asset consultants that are doing a tremendous job to increase awareness of the ILS asset class across institutional investors, to attract capital across all non-life strategies, so both liquid and illiquid, we've seen a strong preference from investors to invest in catastrophe bonds. So year to date, we've seen a record issuance of property catastrophe bonds of around 10 billion, of which probably 5 billion comes from new money. Now, this is to introduce the first question to Chantal. So what is needed to stimulate more investors' interest, also for private placements? Mm. And uh, do you see clients on the fence with dry powder waiting to allocate? Yeah, so I think, and this isn't going to surprise anybody, I think for um, some of our clients and some investors we work with, the issues uh, that they face investing in private placements um, are structural in the sense that in order to bring this proposal before an investment committee, they'd, be able, they'd have to be able to show at least one or two years, years of, uh, of, of good returns. Um, and in addition to that, I think there, so there is, there is interest in, in investing in, in private placements. Um, there's probably a bit more caution and a bit of a desire to be able to trust your manager to do the right thing um, and to recognize when maybe the opportunity set isn't what was promised to the investor and then making the courageous decision of, of returning assets. And so because for an investor, the asset class can be quite opaque, the level of trust required is really high, and the level of transparency. Um, manager communication to investors is so important, um, making it as clear as possible what the opportunities are and what the manager is investing is so important. And we hope that, can I? Bring, bring this up. <laughs> um, we hope that we, the, uh, we've been working with the SBAI to produce the insurance open protocol, um, which is now hopefully only weeks away from, from rolling out. And we hope that this tool, which should standardize reporting of, of insurance portfolios, will allow investors to better understand what sort of risks are being invested in and allow them to roll up their investments into a larger portfolio overview. And that should increase comfort level with the asset class, and so bring confidence to decisions to invest in, um, in private placements. Yeah, actually, Open Protocol is a great tool now, uh, Chantal and I always joke, because it's, whilst it's a great tool, also requires a, a, lo a, a huge amount of input. So, so it's quite uh, daunting for us and managers, but we obviously welcome this initiative, because it will help to develop the understanding of the ILS investors. And uh, uh, Raffaele, maybe you can also comment on uh, this question. Um, sure, or on the answer. <laughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. No, it makes sense in the sense that there is a general case for ILS always in a, a portfolio of uh, institutional investors. Um, and probably nowadays it's even more attractive than in the past. We have heard it from Burkhardt. Um, having said so, um, the difference between the public or the liquid allocations versus the private placements, um, <coughs> there obviously the past has been a little bit bumpy or the investment experience has been uh, uh, challenging, as we all know. And I guess there indeed the gap or the past still is still present in a way. So um, what an institutional investor looks for is consistency. Right? They want to be sure that whatever happened in the past is reproducible in the future. And here we are at the stage where this is not clear to them, right? How, how is the past still possible going forward, especially in the private placement? And I think there we need, as an industry, we need to make them more comfortable that we are on top of things, or things have improved materially. I think there it's a, it's a gap to catch up versus the public, where the cap on have performed as expected in the better years as well as in the more challenging years. And um, this is something to catch up with education and obviously showing what changed, to which extent, and how this can be to their benefit in the future. So there is a lot of work that ILS managers need to do to basically 
show investors that their portfolios has, have evolved <laughs> uh, and what the lessons learned are and also prove that uh, tighter terms and conditions are actually so favorable that ultimately portfolios should be able to deliver the returns that they expect. Right, and you know, the evidence for this, but also, as I said before, that's a business of trust. Trust is built up gradually over time. It vanishes fast, though. And so that's something that the industry, and, and Burkhardt also alluded to before, that's why the industry needs to get better. It invested, institutional investors are here for the long term. They really are, typically, or generally. So if the interests are not necessarily aligned in the terms of the investment horizon, then there is this gap of trust. Are we on the same page here or not? And the last couple of years were challenging this, this alignment for the longer term. And, um, and that's where we work on. And do you, do you still see a lot of discrepancy in communication between uh, different ILS managers, uh, or everyone is uh, getting there, in your opinion? No, I, I guess uh, typically the managers are very interested to explain what happened, um, also to the very details, which to some extent are, are scary for investors, right? So what an ILS manager can do better is, and I try to make this, uh, this comparison. I remember Steve Jobs selling the iPhone for the first time, or showing the iPhone. And it's very complex, the iPhone. But what the end user gets, it's very intuitive. He knows what to do to 90% of the time. In ILS, we are still showing all the little pieces that should then come together, hopefully, at some point. right? And, uh, and then it doesn't always, at least in the past, didn't add up to the extent the investor expected the iPhone to be. And so here the manager needs to make a better job in A, listening to the clients, what do they want at all? Which type of iPhone do we need to produce for them? Versus all the single pieces that, as an ILS manager, you could do, but do not really come together for the end client necessarily. So listening first, and then really try to, that's what they want, and that's what we can offer. I, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to agree with, yeah. with Rafael, because I think that there is such a desire to explain what's going on and to really show all of the workings that it almost in a sense sometimes the, the headlines can, can get lost and it's hard to, to pick through everything and, and yeah, listening to the investor and understanding what, what their concerns are and then being able to address that is, is such, a, such an important part. That's very interesting. I think one of the challenges is always that uh, if you are an ILS manager, you really want to be as transparent as possible mm -hmm. in explaining what could go wrong uh, yeah. as well. And that's where you go into a lot of the details uh, because obviously you're always worried about mis-selling or forgetting something. And, uh, but, uh, I do, and also probably the amount of time that an investor could dedicate to you, right? Sometimes you have an hour to deliver a message and, uh, and you want to cover everything and make sure that they come back also with the tricky questions in the future. So uh, Martin, you're a rel relatively new allocator uh, to the space uh, as in the, maybe actually you can explain what you guys uh, have done uh, in the capital space and uh, what made you pull the trigger is probably obvious. Yeah. but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we managed multi-asset funds for 10 years. Uh, we kept on looking at the asset class. I clearly know what it's about in, 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 all our, in the investment case. Um, but I think part of the philosophy of my funds is we want to do things ourselves. So um, that, that was always a challenge, I guess. Um, and so looking at the asset class again at the first part of last year, just it, it looked like there's a very strong beta case now. And really, the, the level of spreads compared to the expected loss gives us such a margin of kind of safety, really, that we can, we can do that without having to completely um, underwrite every single bond or so, or, or really kind of be, be very focused on, on the very detail that, I guess, uh, the standard insurance manager would do. So it's a, it's a very small, it's, a, it's, it's one of many diversifiers in the portfolio. I don't need to diversify that. It is, it is basis points of risk, to, so, so to say, in our portfolio. Um, but it is very attractive, clearly, right now. So that's, that's I guess, where we came from. So we started building up some kind of capability 
um, just execution capability at the early part of last year and then um, yeah, bought bonds over the, the last kind of uh, 12 months or so, nine months. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chantal, at a more tactical level, uh, the world is now facing a slowdown in growth and a potential recession, particularly in China. Are investors further looking to underweight uh, cyclical investments and find those true diversifiers such as ILS? I think, um, I think the interest from investors in, in ILS, the, the, the largest argument for it is its diversifying nature. Sometimes when, when discussing diversifiers, um, it stands out. It sometimes gets mentioned alongside litigation financing and drug royalties. I mean, these sorts of like really esoteric diversifying asset classes, that's, that's the primary reason for investing it in it. The decision to invest in it now is sort of a relative attractiveness <laughs> argument. Um, but that's not just to say that because the pricing is really high, um, an investor will want to get in. They're asking themselves, is the pricing good relative to the risk that I'm taking? And is this a good decision relative to the other opportunities that are, that are out there? Um, I think sometimes we might say that insurance is like diversifying and fully insulated from, from the other capital, capital markets, but it is part of this larger decision, decision making process. But the attraction to ILS has more to do with its internal characteristics now rather than, than um, what's going on, on out externally. Rafael, is your experience similar? Or? Yes, very much. I guess there are. <coughs> couple of factors which play a role in, in the general decision-making process uh, at the client's level. It's liquidity, um, kind of lock-up or maturity of, of the investment, expected maturity, and obviously risk and return, um, and the combination of all these three. And of the situation for ILS changed over the last couple of months, 18 to 24 months materially. But it doesn't mean that the world around it didn't change. So uh, that's also something that the ILS manager tend to underestimate. The involvement or the appetite of investing in ILS is not on a standalone basis. It's always also a relative game to the outside world. Al along these three aspects, but more so also in terms of uh, simplicity or complexity. You know, now we, we experience with the higher fixed income environment, um, the appetite goes along more simple product. The institutional investors need to make their liabilities on the long term, right? And they go with whatever they can achieve over the long term as simple as possible in the sense that avoid surprises, avoid being off uh, kind of benchmarks where, where they get measured to. And so the higher fixed income environment obviously helps the ILS, given the structures that we have, but also puts, let's say, the competition outside of ILS at the higher level. Um, and that's something to keep in mind. It's actually interesting, a comment from Chantal, that uh, ILS is mixed with music royalties, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it goes into a similar bucket, obviously. As an ILS manager, we try to push investors to add uh, a lot of ILS to the fixed income bucket as well, or mm -hmm. you know, try to find other avenues. So, so, so maybe one of the helps from the consultants could be to look at more investment buckets and see you know, whether there is a <coughs> justification to add uh, ILS also within other investment buckets. Yeah, this bucketing approach is a little bit uh, coarse and uh, uh, kind of... Uh, a success in a way that every client has its own bucket, especially in the, in the regulatory regime. Usually ILS gets allocated to the alternative buckets, that for sure, and that within the private uh, for longer term. But we also see clients that they put it into um, fixed income and compare it to high yield type of, especially when it's uh, focused on cap bonds and the more public stuff. So. Again, you have to kind of adapt and be flexible on the client's view and what's the purpose of their allocation within the portfolio. And then you can start to design a potential solution for them within 
I was more technical, basically. Yesterday, funny enough, for the first time, I received a reply from an investor saying that he was not familiar with ILS, and he said, thank you, I have enough for private debt, which was like, OK. I still haven't replied. I need to think about how to reply to that, que <laughs> but to that comment. But that's, yeah. that's not on, on that uncommon, by the way. You know, it's private. It's debt in terms of you can have losses if something happens. You have a fixed kind of coupon that you earn to. Uh, that's their thinking. That's what I'm trying to say. That's what we need to face also as an industry. That part of the client relationship is important because these are our clients. No, I agree. I agree. The, you know, I, I did see the angle for the life business uh, on private debt uh, yeah. because it's you know financing, but not really for ILS so far. But uh, any any anyway, we don't really mind, right? So if uh, if we manage to crack the private debt bucket, <laughs> why not? Let's give it a try. Now, uh, Martin, in a, you know. In, is the recent surge uh, in inflows to carbon opportunistic or systemic? And uh, obviously, we've seen more entrants coming uh, uh, in the space. Uh, and uh, how do you benchmark ILS versus other investment opportunities? Yeah, I think, um, as Chantal said, it's, it's very hard to find similar asset classes. I mean, music royalties, they, 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 some of the things are, are really, really exotic and have a much smaller, I guess, market footprint. So it is, it is quite, a, quite a special asset class in that sense. If you, if you were to run a op portfolio optimizer, you would end up with a huge allocation. Um, but I think in terms of where, where, where most asset allocators are, I think there is still a bit of a view in the kind of backwards. Um, so how has performance been? Equities have done really well. All alternatives struggle a little bit. That's my observation over the last couple of years. Um, and then I think there is always there is a bit of illiquidity. So I think a lot of investors also struggle with that. I think if I look at kind of my client base, UKDB is clearly de-risking, is disappearing uh, to a degree. So some of these investors will will disinvest over the relatively uh, next couple of years or so. Now for for, for us, I think uh, it is very much if spreads stay where they are, we will stay invested. If we build up a bit of a positive track record, our allocations can clearly go up. I think there's always a bit of a reputational risk for a lot of investors. Um, you run an optimizer, you would get to huge allocations. Is anyone going to put half of their portfolio into ILS? Probably not. That's a, that's a ginormous risk. So this, there's, there's limits on that scale, I think, that are almost more important than attractiveness. Um, so what is a sensible allocation that an investment committee doesn't get shouted at if it goes wrong? And um, so people have, have, have really limits um, in that sense, I guess. And uh, it's our assumption that multi-asset uh, managers do need the liquidity, right? Uh, we can't expect you one day to move uh, from more liquid carbons to less liquid product placement. Um, I think in a multi-asset fund, there is always a mix of more liquid and less liquid building blocks. So there is there is scope to have, take some illiquidity uh, that needs to be rewarded, and you need to find a find a, a way to match that up with the client base and what you can get in terms of likely outflows and, and liquidity needs from my clients. So there is, I think, there is scope for some illiquidity in that sense. Um, I, I have some illiquid building blocks. It's not the kind of the ILS side, so there's no kind of private market. It's all kind of the liquid bonds, but it, it's always that matching up the investments versus the, the client needs. And is it still uh, real estate infrastructure? Uh, yeah, in yeah. The there's, there's private market credit. Um, yeah. OK. So uh, interesting. Now, in terms of uh, ESG, um, is it a nice to have, Chantal, or is it uh, <laughs> essential for clients? I think it depends on the client. Um, we'll let ourselves be led by the investor on what's important to them when looking at managers. From our point of view, um, we were, when we're looking at ESG with a manager, what we consider is whether the manager is doing something different than its peers in considering ESG and whether that can be demonstrated as resulting in outperformance, ideally. Um, but whether it's, in, whether it's a nice to have or, or <coughs> intrinsically important really is an investor by investor 
um, basis. And what, what ESG means to them is also highly personal. And you do have sense. clients from around the world. So yeah. actually, you know, if you go to the US, then there are certain states that they don't really want to hear about ESG, right? So The conversations are different. Conversations. Yeah. OK. In your experience, Rafael? Yes, I think ESG had a big run a couple of years ago. It kind of slowed down, to be honest, for various reasons. I guess people tend to connect ESG immediately or naturally with ILS, given the risk factor of this asset class. But over time, one has realized that um, if you want to do it in a certain way, then we need more granularity, more data, more information. And then still remains the question, to which extent does that get reflected in the investment decision and then final results of the portfolio? So I think that is still an open question. Um, the industry is, as we haven't experienced that the industry has gone a clear way. Uh, there was, a, as I said, there was general interest a couple of years ago. I think also from a client's perspective, we kind of acknowledge that um, maybe it's not let's say, that important within their overall purpose of allocation as they used to. They find other asset classes where this can be uh, executed more easily in a way. And this is for the Swiss market, right? For the Swiss uh, market, okay. Excellent, thank you. And Martin, was it a consideration, uh, ESG, mm. when you guys decided yeah, to put the definitely. trigger? Yeah, definitely. I think um, my main clients are UK pension schemes, and <coughs> um, every client is interested in ESG. and. Um, uh, typically has some kind of targets or some of their own philosophy. So uh, ESG is definitely really important. I think what is sometimes a bit tricky is people interpret it differently, right? And it goes between ethical and for return, and it's 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 quite quite unclear sometimes. And so you, so we get kind of pushbacks almost almost from from kind of both ends. Some people say it is. In, in some way, I don't understand it, but in some way unethical. I think that the name catastrophe bonds was probably not a smart choice. <laughs> um, so I tried to talk about it as insurance-linked securities, and then someone comes up and said, oh, these are catastrophe bonds, like it's an evil word. Um, so that's, <laughs> I, that's, I think, the ethical side. I have some pushback, and, and that, that worked up to now. And then the second one is clearly the for return. That's all about climate change, and then I think that is it's clearly there, but if the, if the premium is big enough, then that is a, is a risk that's being managed. Um, but, but it is definitely a concern for everything that we do. Now, you, you mentioned that, you know, if the premium is big enough, and uh, obviously we always keep an eye on the difference or the decoupling, in which should happen in normal market conditions between pricing of carbons and pricing of private placements, right? So maybe this is open to uh, Chantal and, and Raffaele. The, what do you expect going forward? So do you expect the two markets or the you know, yields to keep compressing and the private placement to deliver this liquidity premia and then investors maybe transitioning and moving from more liquid to less liquid assets, also looking at other asset classes or, or not? I mean, what is your expectation over the next year or two years? Hmm. I think... I think it would be, it, it's difficult for me to Im imagine, and maybe this is just a failure of imagination, um, for me to imagine a scenario in the future where if the private placement market, as long as it doesn't have a secondary market, um, for the liquidity premium to, to go away. And I think for our investors, that's attractive, but the other factor that makes the private market attractive is the diversification of the perils and regions that are available in the private markets versus the catastrophe bond market. Because if you're comparing the EP curve of a cat bond fund to the EP curve of a fund that writes private private placements, um, you, you know they, the where they're crossing the x-axis is different, and sometimes that's a little bit scary. And how quickly a cap on fund can, can decline because of how correlated the tail is um, can, can sometimes look a little scary. And so that, 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 I think that comes down to, to a, a matter of, of preference. Um, there's probably an element of 
of investors regaining confidence in the asset class and, and um, you know, perhaps they start off in the cap bond market, they feel comfortable with the jargon and the risks that are at play and then from there they move on in, into, um, into the private placement market. That, that may happen, but we also see that, you know, that movement happen within one decision <laughs> cycle as well. So um, it's hard for me to say what, what will happen well, in the next like, two years. Yeah, yeah. You made an interesting comment about the tail risk, right? And yeah. actually, uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, Rafael can add his opinion on it. But the, uh, basically, as, a, as an ILS manager, we spend a lot of time uh, always uh, tailoring portfolios to make sure that we meet uh, certain return criteria uh, versus uh, what is the downside risk. And then when we look at the tail, you know, the values <coughs> vary from a minus 20 to minus 40. But then when you talk to cons some consultants, uh, Rafael, I know you have your, your own opinion, and they say, well, you know, once you have a big event, uh, what is the difference in losing uh, 30 or 25. I mean, they're not going to give you a trophy because you, lo you lost 5% uh, less than someone else. So I mean, what's your take on this, Rafael? Um, okay, so two questions. One on the cap bonds versus yeah, uh, private, place. private placement and, and the outlook, and then on this one. Um, let's start with the outlook. Um, we as a consultant, depending on the client's need, tend to be fearful of having at least the potential to play in both segments, right? It opens the opportunity set, <coughs> and you can play the relative attractiveness. If liquidity requirements, if tail risk, whatever consideration you have, you have a broader opportunity set. Having said so, if you look from the other angle, from the seeding perspective, then they literally, those that can issue a cap bond or private placement, they probably do not care if it's cap bonds or private placement. They care about how much do I need to pay, right? As we experienced over the last couple of months, price or premium, even in ILS, is driven by supply and demand, okay? So cap bonds have had a great run this year as well. Uh, the market has grown. Capital has been brought to the market. So they've experienced now, to some extent, a spread compression which is natural what, what happened. Private placement seem to, the premium seem to be go up. First indication for Monte Carlo, pre-discussion, it will continue. I don't know, not to the same extent, probably at the same pace, but keep going. Why? We have talked about it. Capital is still lacking going in for various reasons. So this cycle will, will always be there. When capital comes in, prices go down. When capital goes out, prices increase. And that's why we need to be active in both segments. But to me, no seed will pay more on a private placement because there is illiquidity for the investors. <laughs> that will not happen. So it's about going there, see what's the risk. Is it worthwhile to take or not? And be active in both segments if possible, but not for the reason we want to do this or we want to only do that, just because it makes sense for the investors. Um, and times, uh, the attractiveness of these two segments vary as they did in the past. Um, that's one. On the second one, yes, so tail risk obviously is a big concern. Um, imagine being a, an asset uh, manager on an on a institutional investor. They have to go to the investment committee on a regular basis. The asset class per se is considered a little bit um, esoteric, sometimes it's called, right? And so, yes, they are concerned of losing um, of a big event and then losing therefore. Um, our approach is always the allocation overall, and that might be also an answer to before, the allocation overall on their portfolio given a big event. So let's say given they lose 40% or let's say 50 for the sake of, of simplicity, their impact on the overall portfolio should not materially impact their overall return expectation. So they should be able to take the hit on the overall basis, say, OK, bad luck, it happened, but it doesn't hurt us in a way that we cannot continue. So that limits the overall allocation, given in relation to their expected return target they want to make. 
Having said so, obviously they are not happy if they lose a lot. <laughs> that, that's comprehensible. Having said so, I think from an ILS manager, it gets overestimated the potential benefits that you get, as you, uh, in your example, of losing 25 versus losing 30. Imagine being in that discussion after the event, and yeah, we have lost 25, and, and the another one had lost 30. For them, at this point in time, it's really the same. Right? That's my personal opinion. Again, yeah, I believe that the discussion is really the same. It's a lot of money that got lost, right? And so that, that's the essence. Yeah, but you know, when you think about other asset classes like yeah. equity, for example, yeah. then uh, it's pretty common to benchmark the, the performance versus uh, an index. And then yeah. they can say, look, we've done better than the index, or uh, even if the index is down 20%, right? Mm. Yes, I mean, you can make these comparison at the end, the emotional factor at this point in time, having lost so much money and then going through all the discussion internally, the minus 30 versus minus 25 will not make people materially more happy. So it doesn't mean that you need to run for minus 30, minus 40, but it's something to consider while constructing the portfolio. And, and really sense their risk tolerance. And again, one of the experiences uh, we've been going through, the risk tolerance is probably uh, within an alternative asset class much lower than within a public asset class. So losing 10% in equity is, is not equally bad as losing 10% in ILS. Mm -hmm. Their reaction to equity, okay, we need to rebalance, it will recover. Their reaction to ILS is, Jesus Christ, we lost 10%. The discussion are just different. That's how the investors think. Okay. Can I just add one other thing yeah. to that? So what, what, one thing we've, yeah. we've seen, and I don't know if you've seen this as well amongst your clients, is that um, what we've seen is our investors sort of divide into two groups uh, just on the subject of tail points. One group is taking the opportunity to, to set an acceptable return target that they're saying, this is, this is what we'll be happy with. We don't need to shoot the lights out. We're not going for something super high octane and taking the opportunity to minimize the risk that they're taking. The other group is saying, this is an opportunity for us to shoot the lights out and go really high octane. This is the risk that we're acceptable, that we, we'd be happy to take, and let's try and maximize, maximize the return on that. And so I think the conversation between down 25 and down 30 will be quite different depending on which group yeah. the, investor, the investor falls and, into. And, and I think that's, that's really the trade-off between investment efficiency of the portfolio. If it's a really quirky thing that's at the fringes, you should go for high risk, high return. Mm. But then people look at this as a reputational thing, yeah. right? There is the option of not having the asset class. Right. There's not the option of having no equities. Right. So this right. is where it's treated differently. Yeah. 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 Right. Thank you. Maybe the last question before uh, we open to the audience. Uh, so. Views uh, on uh, ERN allocations uh, in two scenarios. Uh, one uh, where nothing happens, fingers crossed. And another one, you know, we have a bad year, you know, lots of hurricanes from now until uh, end of November, and then uh, industry losses are high. So what, what do you think would, ha would happen in, uh, in that case with regard to investors' appetite? Me? Yeah, you go first. Again? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first one is easy, right? The one is nothing happens. Then again, uh, it's a good base to continue the discussions and evolve the asset class. That's a given. The second one, um, I guess it can be also an opportunity. I mean, the asset class has done very well so far, right? And um, yes, we are at peak right now in terms of hurricane. Um, but, I mean, the consideration we have had at the beginning of the year, given the rate environment, is also that uh, given an EN this year, we probably still could make some money. So if something happens and it's a reasonable result, that can be really the evidence, look, there have been changes in the asset class, in, as Burkert mentioned, not only in, in rate, but also in terms and condition. And terms of condition actually have been already very effective, uh, even wildfire experience. Um, 2018, 
right, 2018 was <coughs> bad. Since then, it improved quite a lot. And so there we need to work. It's a constant work of improving. And probably also push sometimes it's not, it's not easy for, I understand, from the ILS manager perspective, especially in, in the collateralized world. But sometimes my experience shows that probably a no is better than a yes. If you really believe, well, I could not achieve what, what we wanted to, then a no is probably for, for the longer term better than a yes and hoping that nothing happens. So, but in essence, if nothing happens, perfect. If something happens, we are still in a situation where we can show that the asset class improved material over the last couple of one or two years. Okay. Chantal, do you have any? Yeah, I think generally I, I'm in agreement. If, if nothing happens, the conversations will be a lot, lot easier. Um, whether or not that results in a straightaway uptick in, in investment is hard to say. I think if something does happen, it almost kind of depends on what what the event, what causes the loss to a certain extent, because if it's expected, then that's an easier conversation than if it's an unexpected source of loss. If it's an unexpected source of loss, I think I personally will be having more difficult conversations um, with, with our clients. Martin, what uh, will happen with the legal in general? Um, good question. I think if nothing happens, yeah, we have some bonds that we're just going to keep. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> if something happens, I guess I'm going to see if the people that I think I convinced of the asset class are still convinced. Um, I would hope we can uh, see this as a long-term allocation and then uh, yeah, um, up the allocation again. Great. So we have a lot of hope for investors to add more money over time. Any questions from the audience? Thank you. Um, Martin, I think you touched on this earlier, this idea of diversifying the diversifier, um, this idea that you know, your, your clients are all, for the most part, investing in ILS, um, at least in large part because it's not correlated or, or has low correlation with the rest of their portfolio. So do they then, like, does it vary by client group who, uh, whether they want to see portfolios that have a mix of, say, you know, U.S perils and other, you know, Japanese, European and other perils, if it comes at the expense of, you know, the potential upside? Um, I can only talk for what, what, what we've done. Uh, we tried to make this a beta play, and the beta is clearer in the peak perils. Uh, so there's still some diversification there. And then really, per peril, it is still a couple of basis points of risk, which in the total portfolio context, is, is, is fine. That's, that's nothing in a, in a portfolio that has 5 to 10% volatility because of the market risk factors. Um. A similar question, uh, mostly for Chantal, but the other two if you want to chime in. You know, the, the pitch has been non-correlated, but most of ILS is bought by funds and within the funds are heavily correlated to Florida wind. Yeah. In our experience, we, we have securitized 500 million of casualty risks, and we've had a lot of discussions on life expectancy risk. We have found that it's quite re good reception because it's a diversifier within the funds. So the question is, is investment sentiment, you know, follow that? Do you have investors that really care about the diversification not so much for geography, but NAT cat versus other risks. Yeah. So um, I think I think I've been saying this a lot recently. I think it depends on the investor. Um, so for, some investors are happy to load up on on peak peril risks because they consider it a diversifier and they're happy to take that. Other investors say this is a this is a diversifier, but I don't want I don't want to have a really, really bad day. And so they're much more open to diversification within other um, property catastrophe peril regions, but also within life and casualty. I think the, the issue um, that we've come across, particularly with casualty, is with property catastrophe, it's 
a lot easier to explain where the losses might come from. Whereas with casualty, it's almost like another learning curve to go up. And that, that I think, in some cases has been a barrier, particularly because you're trying to learn about all these other sources of loss. And you're also, whether or not there's a loss is dependent on how people behave in some cases, rather than what we might deem like a fairly random decision, or not decision, but random experience from, from mother nature. And that, that the, those are some of the barriers that we've seen. Any other questions in the room? Uh, I've got a question for you, Martin. I'm just interested as a large investor, LGIM, how were you looking at and thinking about the cat bond market in terms of its size and scale? Were you confident that you'd be able to get access to the products you needed and that the trading desks would be able to service that? <coughs> yeah, so that's probably what kept me busy for almost six months last year, um, basically onboarding brokers, uh, seeing how, that, how everything works in our systems. Um, so in, in, in principle, they're clearly bonds, and we do lots of bonds, um, but it still is a more well, quirky market from an operational point of view as well. So that's, that's, that's definitely true. Uh, it's more manual in many ways. Um, and so that, that part of that was a, was a challenge for us um, in terms of getting uh, invested. Um, that, that, that worked okay for us, I guess. Um, we were probably, we had kind of good timing where kind of nobody else was, well, one, not many other people were buying. That, that clearly helped us, I guess. But I think the operational side is really kind of uh, uh, required a lot of initial kind of work, I would say. Great, thank you. Uh, hi, Martin. I'm Sophie Jerry from, from SCORE. Um, I have a question regarding your multi-asset uh, portfolio manager. So you very busy man, I can imagine with uh, other assets. So I was wondering uh, why the philosophy of we want to do it ourselves in comparison with yeah. relying on the external managers. And I'm not asking because I sell funds. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, so the funds that I manage are very big, but they're also very cost efficient. Um, so the, the UK DC market in particular, and that's my main kind of market. Um, is all about low fees, or has been for the last couple of years. And that means the fund is sold at, I don't know, 30 basis points, sometimes less. And that makes it very hard to kind of um, manage this as a multi-manager proposition. So we have lots of our existing index capabilities, and then um, kind of a tail of more opportunistic alternative asset classes, and just the way this this market needs to work in the commercials. That is, that is a main driver. And that really drove our investment approach. Right? Uh, that, 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 that means there needs to be more focus on kind of beta. And uh, clearly, I'm not claiming to know the same thing as uh, the kind of the, the, the professional managers. No other questions in the room. Um, Chantal and Rafa, um, what, what's the one thing that needs to happen to continue to see the interest we're seeing today? Um, if the capital starts to come in much more quickly, and obviously you were talking about the cycle, and naturally rates will go down, but is there, is there a limit in investors' eyes now? As in, what do investors need to see from managers to, to Have investors got a limit in terms of what they'd, they'd be willing to accept in terms of softening now? Have they set their, be their baselines higher than they were historically, perhaps? I think it depends on the investor. I think for <laughs> the... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think for the investors that are in it, because the, the prices are high and um, are taking the opportunity to, 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 to be opportunistic, they probably won't have as much appetite for, for softening. Um, for the investors that have set a, an acceptable <coughs> return target and are wanting to minimize risk, I think for them the consideration is 
probably not going to be so much on the, the price softening side as long as the returns are acceptable, but on the terms and conditions side and making sure that the terms are protecting them from the losses that they're not signed up for. Yeah, I can echo that. We haven't had discussions where there is a hard quantified limit to the extent um, investors expect it to not fall below or keep going up in a way. It's really more the relation to the outcome of the year over time, given what happened. So is this in relation to what they have expected or could have expected? So our experience showed that, you know, overall, even if there were challenging years in the past, the overall result is manageable in a way or another. It's really the source of the losses that caused these results, which were disturbing to some, if not a lot of investors. Uh, and these unpleasant surprises, that's what kind of let the trust vanish. And once this decision has been taken, then it's tough to, to get them back on board. So no unpleasant surprises, I would say. That, so you, that's what keeps going. You manage trust a few times. So you have never seen an investor exiting because uh, you know, they were not pleased with the performance uh, and then coming back uh, like in three, four years' time later? Maybe change uh, of management, uh, change of views? Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. Okay. But obviously, uh, you know, when an institutional investor, at least in Switzerland, they go through their, their allocation procedure. And once they have they are in, typically it lasts three to five years, and then they reconsider their whole allocation given what's going on in the market. So once they have decided to be in, then it takes three to five years, and likewise when they have gone out. And, uh, and, and that's how it works. Okay, well, look, thank you very much. Oh, thank there you. There was another oh. one, I guess. Uh, question there. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Sharon Haran from Parametrics. Maybe kind of a spoiler to the next session. Could you say something about the openness of investor and their tolerance toward new risk like cyber? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we see limited appetite, very limited, to not say none, and, and related to the potential of unpleasant surprises. Yeah. It's just an black box, um, and, and so the assessment is very difficult. It has some general um, positives, as it is uh, certainly, again, uncorrelated to, to any other type of risk factor in ILS or generally uncorrelated, but for instance, it's not a given that it's uncorrelated to any type of financial market risk they have in the portfolio. So again, the potential for upside is very limited from a and investor perspective to get into this space, the potential for downside is is large, too large, currently. Yeah, I would I would echo that. I think for investors, one of the attractions of property catastrophe <coughs> is how well modeled it is, and how clear it is, and how tested um, managers' knowledge and experiences. The I th I think right now. It, other risks are probably just a little, a little bit too new and need to be a little more tested, and there needs to be more observation done. Okay, thank you. We're going to have to break there. So please put your hands together for the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.